So if I could invite Professor Ken Yudis, Dr. Hung Chang Yao, and uh, Dr. Christoph, Christoph to come to the stage, please. Um, ready for the session. <laughs> Gentlemen, I am also keeping time. So if you hear little bells, that's me. If you look over the chair, over to that table there, and you see numbers like five minutes to go, that'll be me, so that's for sure. But Dr. Christoph, I'll hand over to you. Good morning. It is my great pleasure to chair this session and welcome all of you to this session. We have two very distinguished speakers from overseas, but they are not foreign to Australia. Professor Ken Yudas from USA and Dr. Hun Chang Jung from Brunei. Let me introduce the first speaker. Professor Ken Yudas, who I'm maintaining an appointment as Anjak Professor at the University of Southern Queensland, uh, has engaged in independent consulting since ret returning to North America this year. Ken Yudas recently served as the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academic Services, and Chief Information Officer of the University of Southern Queensland, a role he began in 2013. From 2009 to 2012, Ken served as the Chief Executive Officer of the UMass Online, and prior to this appointment, spent three years as the Executive Director of Penn State World Campus. Ken has also held position as the director of the Sunny Learning Network and as director of e-learning group at the Open Polytechnic of New Zealand. In addition to his managerial roles, he has enjoyed teaching assignments at numerous colleges and universities, including four-year assignment as a visiting professor at Universita Komenskoko Faculta management in the Slovak Republic. An advocate, educational access, he taught online his first course in 1995 for the University of Maryland European Division. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Professor Ken Judas. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to uh, start with uh, simply acknowledging the, um, uh, the custodians of, of the land on which we stand. Um, I think it's also worth uh, acknowledging the legacy of colonization uh, and with it the uh, dispossession, violence, and um, uh, cultural appropriation that's come along with it. I think the reason why I mention that isn't necessarily because we're in Australia, it's because it's a international uh, phenomenon. It's part of, it's part of uh, who we are as a international and, and global community. It's part of uh, our humanity. Um, I am, this will be computer mediated. That is, I've got a clicker. Uh, I'm, I'm not terribly facile. Uh, so we'll see how this, oh, actually there's, that's uh, not where we really should be. Let's go to the beginning, and wow, we did pretty well. We went way past the, uh, uh, we went way faster than the 15 minutes. Um, I guess I'd like to start by just saying that um, this, is, this is going to be uh, a little bit of a fact-driven um, uh, presentation. Uh, I, I have to say that when I was asked uh, to do this, I, I looked at the title and I said, this is just fantastic. The whole idea of looking at inclusive growth uh, leading to inclusive society is, is wonderful. And, and inside of that is embedded a few assumptions about inclusivity, exclusivity, uh, how we look at growth, and so on and so forth. So I'd like to tease that apart a little bit over the next like 10 minutes. Um, and I do apologize because I will uh, occasionally be looking back and pointing at things, and it's not meant to be disrespectful. It's simply that I can't see behind me. Um, in addition, I can make the presentation of this material available if you like. Here's some of the resources that uh, support this. There are others as well, but I think that these are sort of independent sources that, that, that might be of interest. Um, so have we been experiencing inclusive growth 
And I started there thinking, well, what, what does that really mean? And uh, how does that relate to the, to the, to the ha second half of the, uh, of the presentation or of the, of the title that has to do with inclusive society? Um, and I'm going to run through a few uh, uh, slides. Uh, and hopefully that will just provide a few perspectives on how growth has been measured and how it's and what's happening. So um, this is a, a little bit of a complex uh, uh, graphic. It really is a measure of, of the, uh, the growth of wealth uh, as a percentage. So we'll see here that um, there's a whole lot going on here in the, in the bottom 50% of, uh, of wealth holders. And uh, what we have is a, uh, a nice, we do see that there has been growth along the um, uh, spectrum. But we also see here at this end, that it's really quite uh, exaggerated. And in fact, if you look at it over the past 36 years, the uh, bottom part of the uh, wealth curve is uh, the bottom half uh, captured about 12% of, of wealth, while the uh, top 1% about 27%. And that is growth, so it's based on something. And we'll see in the next slide that it actually translates to a pretty large dif difference in, in actual wealth holding. So um, this, one, this, this slide here is, uh, illustrates what, what we have here. Um, when we look at the part of the po world's population, this is adult population that, uh, whose total uh, wealth value is under 10,000 US dollars. That represents about 71% of the population, uh, that is about 71% uh, of the population, 2.7% par of, um, of, of the wealth, of international wealth. Right now, global wealth is estimated at about three, $320 trillion. And we look over here at the, um, uh, at the top one-tenth of, of 1%, one and um, we see that there's about 12.8%. So the difference is, is that we have about 50% of the, uh, or rather 70% of the, hold on for a second, sorry, 70% of the population accounting for about um, $8 trillion and uh, less than one-tenth of 1% at about 140 trillion dollars of, of wealth. So we see that, that actually it's, it, there's, there's, there's not a, a lot of inclusivity there. It's pretty exclusive. Um, the uh, next one here basically says that when we get even more focused on those who have the most amount of wealth, it becomes even more extreme with four one thousandths of one percent accounting for about 13 percent of the total uh, financial value of the world. So it gets, it gets more and more exclusive as we get more and more wealthy. Uh, as, or as we look at populations that are more and more, parts of the population that are more wealthy. I did want to take a quick look as well at groupings. Now, this actually, you look at it and you say that's okay news, that in fact, what we're seeing over the 10 years between 2001 and 2011 is that the curve is moving to uh, less poor into, into more wealthy. But it is also important to recognize that we still have about, in 2011, 15% of the world's population earning $2 or less a day. And 80, it's about 86% um, that is earning less than $20 a day. So it's a, it's, that's a, uh, that is a relatively, it's a very large percentage of the world earning very, very small amounts of, of, of money. Um, two of the last things I'm going to mention along these lines is that not only is uh, wealth uh, uh, not evenly distributed, and we know that, and not only is it, is it growing, but in fact, geographically, it's really quite, uh, it's not terribly uh, equitably distributed as well. Of the approximately 195 countries in the world, uh, 11, 11 of them um, are featured here uh, in terms of their percentage of millionaires. Uh, it accounts for about 86% of the world's uh, millionaires are in these 11 countries, and half of those are in the United States. Uh, and it's unfortunate because when you look in the United States, those millionaires aren't sharing very well. And in fact, what we're seeing here over the past, uh, since 1980, is uh, that the top 1% has grown very significantly in terms of not numbers, but their accumulation of wealth. 
and that has, and the bottom half has, has, has decreased. Now we know most of this already, and then it, but it, it does ask us, or, and I should say, I was gonna say one other thing about this, is that it's easy to say, ah, oh, those Yankees, look at that, that's horrible. But if we go along, we see that that's the case in many countries, is that you're getting this concentration of wealth over these years. I haven't included it, but way up here someplace are some other groups. It's in Brazil, we have the concentration of more than 60% of the wealth, in the 10%, and that's true also in the Middle East. Um, so I was really just sort of going through that um, uh, just to illustrate that that's the case. So as we can see, material wealth is really quite concentrated. It's exclusive, it's not inclusive. So it poses the question, um, uh, given this exclusivity, does that prohibit an inclusive society? That is, does, does the, the, the fact that we do not have inclusive growth mean that we, does that, how does that impact on inclusive society? So what can we do about that change? And I, I guess that I don't, I guess that we'll have a chance to go back and forth a little bit at some point, but it's, it's, it's something that's worth thinking a little bit about, is there's something fundamental that makes it very difficult for us to do our, our work? Um, and what can be done uh, to change that? Uh, which is a, a question that, of course, all of us are asking. And I would suggest, and we know that this is the case, is that what we might want to be doing is rethinking it. That is, I just spent uh, the past five minutes or so, seven minutes, talking about distribution of financial wealth. What if we talked more about what that wealth is doing and where it should be? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. But what if we just say, we don't care. We don't, I don't want to hear how, how wealthy a country is. I want to hear, or I want to see, or I want to judge that nation or society or whatever the case may be based not upon their accumulation of wealth, but how that's converted into well-being, how that's being used. So we might say we can think about growth in terms of growth in education, growth in physical and mental well-being, all of these sorts of, of, of qualities, quality housing, child care, elder support and elder care, uh, human dignity, uh, environment, and so on and so forth. And we know that we have indexes that are quality of life indexes. And if you look at virtually any of them, Australia comes out always in the top three or four. So this is as good as it gets. Um, if, if, if you're, you know, this is about as good as it gets. The U.S. ends up in about the top 10, maybe 10, 11. Mexico is in the, is, is usually around in the, in the bottom part of the top third and so on. So it gives you sort of a sense for, Egypt tends to be pretty, pretty low on the quality of life, Tajikistan and so on, as you can imagine. So um, really where I'm going with it is that um, the, we don't refer to this, we don't, we don't refer to quality of life very frequently when we're making index decisions or when we talk about our growth. Um, so if we're going to though start rethinking and start saying, well, let's look at quality of life, let's look at those sorts of things, who's gonna actually do that? How's that, how's that dialogue going to change from, uh, wealth, from, uh, from such an emphasis on wealth accumulation to that on, uh, on, on growth of, of well-being. How, how does that take, how does that change, and how will it be done? Who's gonna start that conversation or be part of it? Um, and this is how we stand. I'm just gonna take a moment and talk a little bit because I know that we have a very, we have a very diverse, very international uh, group here. And I will just, I just wanna say that, I, I just wanna build a little bit of a story about a, a, that has a pattern. Um, for Western uh, countries, and you might see parallels in other countries that you're from, in Western countries, uh, what we've seen over the past century has been a pattern in which we've gone through feudal and mercantile society into industrialization. And when we become industrialized, we achieve a status of advanced capitalism. That is, we start concentrating wealth, we start concentrating the mode of production and so on. And um, what happens is, is that, what happens, it happened in the UK, in the United States, and in Canada, uh, and in Australia to a certain degree, is that we went through a phase of uh, free market capitalism and things got really, really, really bad. 
really bad. And uh, so what had happened was people got mad and started revolutions and started to protest and things became really dangerous for really wealthy people and their financial interests. So, you know, right around the turn of the cent last century in the United States, we passed from, we passed really from the Gilded Age into a uh, liberal democracy. And basically what happened was the Carnegies and the Rockefellers and those folks who you may or may not, not be familiar with basically said, geez, we really need to have a social network or a social fabric to be able to keep the, the, the laborers, the people, from revolting. And we created the liberal state, the welfare state. And that existed for years, decades, right up until the 1980s when we became neoliberal. Now, I know that this is not terribly exciting, but I will tell you that what happened at that point is that we started pulling apart that social network. What we, what, what we could depend on in terms of childcare, in terms of unemployment, in terms of uh, quality um, um, uh, uh, law enforcement, whatever the case may be, that started getting teased apart and dismantled in the United States and in the UK. And we can think about this in terms of the Thatcher, Bush, year, or rather Reagan years, a little bit later here, uh, in Australia. What happened though that's important to us during that period of time is that there was massive conversions of public wealth into private wealth. That is, we, we went through a period of time in which the, we corporatized or we privatized a lot of what fell into the public. And that is how we reinvested into, the, into our well-being, the, so those programs that allowed us to grow our, our health and well-being and so on. So, this is how we stand right now, is that over the past years, we see the general trend in, 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 in most uh, countries, in most, in most of these countries, Spain, UK, Japan, France, US, Germany, basically private capital going up and public capital going down. And we see way here at the bottom in 2015, the United States and the UK actually had a negative balance for public capital. Our ability to be able to reinvest public funds, what we create as a society, back into society was almost diminished. That is, we owed more than we had, which is absolutely amazing. And it prohibits, or it makes it very difficult for the state to do what the state kind of promises it's gonna do, take care of its population. So, the good news is that this is all just policy, and we can reverse it if we want. We just have to do it. And uh, this is part of, and I think that this is part of the, part of the dialogue. Um, so there's nothing that's irreversible about our situation. And what are our options? Now, once again, I know that I'm talking at a, I know that this is a, an interfaith uh, meeting, uh, 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 conference, uh, but these will be relatively I guess, secular or public policy sorts of, of, of statements. Um, oh, this is another point that I wanted to bring up, is that there are options and there are policies, and I did want to bring this up, is that if we look right now and we just look at trajectories, patterns, if the world follows the U.S. way of doing things, this is how the top 1% and the bottom 50% will look by 2050, so in about, what, 30 years. And we can see that with the U.S. model, the 1% continues to go up and the bottom 50% continues to go down in terms of uh, the amount of wealth they hold. If we just follow our current pattern, this is where we're going to be. But if we look at European states, and if we took the U.K. out, it would look even better. Um, uh, they start getting closer. And in fact, what we start looking at is this convergence. Now, I'm not suggesting that the world can run like the European Union, but there's an example of the types of policies that take place, the type of uh, the, the, the demands that are being made on government that actually has the disparity decreasing rather than increasing. And it's probably something with, that's worth looking at, in my opinion. So, that all being said, what if we manage to re what if what if we manage to rethink the way we, we think about growth and what we think is important and what if we expand it to include those qualities on 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 uh, well on social well being? Um, can we start to rebuild our uh, yep our growth agenda that is inclusive of society? And here's some of the things that I think that we could probably do. And there's some things here that would challenge some of our fundamental assumptions about the nature of 
our economy, how capitalism works, and so on. And basically, progressive taxation, and we see that in Europe. There are, some, there are countries that have very good progressive taxation schemes, and in fact, it keeps the disparity reasonably uh, reasonable. Income ceilings, that's something that no one wants to talk about. But if you work for the, pub, if you work for the government, there are income ceilings. But, but how, much, how much personal wealth does anyone need to accumulate? That's a question. It's a valid question. Do we have, is it an idea to actually have income ceilings? Establish a global financial register of private wealth? And um, I'll tell you, uh, I don't know if t Donald Trump would have been electable if we actually did this. It would prohibit, it would make it much more difficult to launder money, uh, and it would make it much more difficult to evade taxes. Uh, to re-contribute to the public. Uh, reverse the trend of privatization, that's what we were talking about. Recognize that natural resources are public resources. And that's a big deal as well. And um, the last thing I'm gonna mention here, and the reason why I highlighted the idea, the idea of uh, the democratic access to education is every event, everyone I've, every time I've heard um, um, uh, the venerable master, the uh, uh, Hanif, uh, other people speak in this forum, it's always come down to education. That's always been a central part of the theme. So the question starts becoming, if we want to start rethinking how we value, what we consider valuable, what we consider wealth, what we consider acceptable levels of reinvestment in the public, what we consider a, a acceptable privatization of public wealth, we need to think about what type of educational program and other types of programs, formal and informal, will actually get that dialogue started and we'll get our children and our grandchildren and maybe ourselves and our policymakers to think a little bit more about this. Um, and so, my question would be, what would that education system look like? Now, I don't have the answer. I've got some thoughts. I'm not going to share them. I've only got 30 seconds. Yep. And uh, so, that's it. So, thank you very much. Uh, that's my email address. Um, I'm happy to share. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Yudas, for your very interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. Our second speaker is Dr. Hun chang Yong. Uh, Dr. Hun is Director and Associate Professor at the Center for Advanced Research at the University of Brunei, Jerusalem. He is currently also Adjunct Research Fellow at the University of Western Australia, where he obtained his PhD in 2007. Prior to joining uh, UBD, he was Assistant Professor of Asian Studies at the School of Social Sciences, Singapore Management University. Dr. Hun is an active researcher specializing in the Chinese diaspora, identity, politics, multiculturalism, and religious and cultural diversity in contemporary Southeast Asia. His monograph, Chinese identity in post-Suharto Indonesia, culture, media, and politics has been translated in, into Chinese and Indonesian languages. He is the co-editor of the Chinese Indonesian races, history, religion, and belonging, and catalyst of change. His publications have been also appeared in international referred journals including International Sociology, Asian Studies Review, Southeast Asia Research, Social Compass, and many others. Could you please welcome Dr. Hung. Very good morning, thank you very much. Um, Thanks especially to Pure Land College uh, for inviting me uh, to this very meaningful uh, conference. Um, I'm very glad that Ken has um, got all the inclusive development hard facts out of the way because I'm going to talk about uh, the social inclusion aspect of uh, inclusivity. Now let me start by talking about something that you're very familiar with, uh, Australia. 
Now, Australia is a very successful model for multiculturalism. Of course, there are up and downs, and there are people in certain pockets that disagree with multiculturalism. But by and large, looking at the world trend today, where many European countries um, are giving up on multiculturalism, where the United States are setting up fences and wars, Australia seems to still be uh, quite a livable and a very successful model, uh, except for the fact that you know, they are turning away asylum seekers and then processing them you know, um, offshore and so on. Uh, multiculturalism, as you will know better than me, in Australia started uh, in about 1970s. At the beginning, it was really to accommodate European migrants from non-Anglo-Saxon background, right? Um, but then that has then expanded to include um, Asian migrants, especially with the uh, refugees coming from Vietnam uh, during the war. But uh, multiculturalism, since its inception, uh, was a drastic shift from Australian policy, from assimilation, white Australian policy, to, uh, to a very accommodating um, uh, policy in which diversity is very much celebrated, valued, um, and has been uh, made into a part of Australian life. However, during the John Howard decade, multiculturalism has become a dirty word. Well, very obvious uh, from the changing of Department of Immigration, Multiculturalism and Indigenous Affairs uh, to Department of Immigration and Citizenship. The idea of citizenship itself is a very exclusive idea because it sets apart people who um, legally should belong here and people who should not belong to this land. And of course, after 9-11, after, you know, um, the war on terror has been launched. We see that there are other developments within Australia when it comes to multiculturalism, the Cronulla riots, anxieties from global migration, refugee crisis, turning back the boat, uh, and offshore processing, and so on. So a uh, relevant question for us to ask, especially for Australians here, um, is where is Australia now when it comes to multiculturalism? How inclusive is the society? There was there are differences between diversity and difference. Um, it is easy to talk about a diverse society when we just put um, people who dress in different costumes on the stage, get them to hold hands, smile and take a photo, and we say we have diversity included. Um, it is an altogether different matter when we talk about dealing with differences. Now, a lot of time, we like the superficial cosmetic side of diversity because it looks good, but we don't want to deal with the deeper level of differences which cause a lot of anxieties and discomfort. When I was working in Singapore, I asked my students to, to stand together. We had an exchange student from the US, a Singaporean Chinese student who is gay, and a Japanese exchange student and an Indian Singaporean student. So I asked them to stand together, hold hands, smile and take a photo. And I said, we have a multicultural class. And that is very superficial because it does not address any kind of tension and differences that is deeper. Now, this is the kind of multiculturalism we see celebrated in a lot of countries, including Singapore. A lot of time we have to examine history in order to understand where we are. Identity is something that people hold on to because it gives them a definition of who they are. However, ident identity has a long history and we have to understand that history. Now I put it in contrast to hybridity because I, I think the difference between identity and hybridity is actually quite stark. Now, for example, if we look at um, migrants' history in many places in the West, including the US and also in Australia, miscegenation was very much frowned upon. Any kind of mixed marriage was seen as a betrayal to racial purity. Now, so you see, in a lot of colonial images, um, the savages are being put together with civilized Western men on a table, but with a lot of discomfort. Miscegenation is definitely being seen as something that is dirty. 
right? And, and there is not a lot of celebration on hybridity, which is the fact of life when different cultures come together, that we hybridize, that we take on each other's cultural elements, whether we like it or not. Identity is very much constructed based on difference. You have to have another for you to realize who you are. So there's always this self and other contrast, us and them, in, in group versus out group. And a lot of times identity is constructed, is built upon primordial qualities. And a lot of these qualities are imagined, right? We belong to this culture. We belong to this civilization. We're different from them because we belong to this tribe. And, and all these definition of identity is based on exclusivism. Right? We are different. We are apart from them. Hybridity, on the other hand, recognizes that identity is fluid, that it is in flux, that all cultures are a result of mixing. It talks about inclusivity, that we have a bit of this and that, that we have a bit of them in us too. So we are not an isolated we. We are, in fact, them. Let me tell you a story. I lived in Australia for 12 years. I did all my studies in Western Australia. And I used to teach in one of those weekend Chinese schools where parents drop their kids in the morning to these schools, get them to learn two, three hours of Chinese, and then come and pick them up while the parents will go for dim sum and all other activities. And I remember the students hated me. They didn't actually hate me, they hated Chinese because you were forced to learn Chinese. Some of your kids might be in the same situation. But one of the things when I, when I started teaching Chinese, one of the things that I was very enthusiastic about is that I am Chinese, that's why I'm teaching Chinese. I'm helping the younger generation of Chinese Australian to know their roots and their identity. And so I remember in those Chinese schools, it is really quite impossible to teach such a complex language a week, on a weekly basis for two and three hours. So a lot of time we get them to do activities, right? We try to transfer culture, cultural knowledge through um, festivals. So we get them to, to, we tell them stories about different festivals. Now one of the festivals that the Chinese celebrate is the Mooncake Festival or the Mid-Autumn Festival. So I get the kids together and tell them about the story of this fairy, Chinese fairy called Chang Er, right? Um, and how she landed up to the moon and so on. And then um, how when we remember the mid Autumn Festival, we look at the full moon and we remember this particular person. And I say, okay, now please draw a poster so that you can take home and show your parents that you learned something about Chinese culture. Right? Draw a poster, a painting of Chang'e. And I've got all these year eight students started drawing what Chang'e might look like. And one of these girls, a Chinese eight years old girl, draw, drew a Chang'e who looked like a Disney character. And her Chang'e looks a lot more like Snow White, or in today's term, Frozen uh, character, rather than the Chang'e that I knew, which is a Chinese fairy. And when I look at the, the drawing, I started laughing at her. I say, well, this is not Chang'e. And then all the other kids sort of rallied around her and started laughing at her. And this poor student burst out in, cry, in, in, in tears. She was just crying nonstop because her Chang'e was being mocked on and, and was being made fun of. And that incident really confronted me. I started thinking to myself, who is Chang'e? Can Chang'e be white? In her imagination, in her world, Chang'e is white because she doesn't know any other fairies except for Disney fairies. And she didn't know that Chinese fairy would look like this. Why am I imposing my version of Chang'e to her? And I'm not even from China. I'm a third generation Chinese from Brunei. And how can I claim authenticity on Chinese culture? How can I deny her her version of a white Chang'e. Now that really confronted me to, to start to accept the idea of hybridity and to let go some of these comfort zones of mine on identity, things that I hold on to, thinking that I am doing the community a service by teaching them Chinese, by imposing 
my chauvinistic idea of Chineseness on them. And there was, there was a, a, a turning point of my teaching um, pedagogy and practice in this particular Chinese school. A lot of time we all have different privileges. We carry with us a knapsack of privileges. Privilege is an invisible package of unearned assets, things that we, no, we have not done anything, we have not sweated to earn. For example, my gender. Born as a male in an Asian context is very privileging. That I can access to a lot of spaces where female cannot access. That I can go out late at night without any question from my family that my sister might not be able to have such access. Right? Being a male means that I'm not subject to a certain kind of glass ceiling in a corporate uh, world. Right? Being a male gives me a lot of autonomy, gives me almost natural leadership opportunity that female might be denied of. A lot of time when we think about all these privileges that we have, right, privilege on culture, privilege on our skin color, privilege on our language, the question is that if we were to shape an inclusive society, are we willing to give up some of those privileges that we have? Are we willing to give up places that male can occupy in an organization and allow female, allow transgender, allow people who are different from us to take those places? That is the first step towards inclusivity, to sacrifice your privilege. A lot of time when we are majority, we enjoy this tyranny of the privileged majority. Now, one privilege of the privilege is not to see their privilege, because your privilege, you don't tend to see your privilege. Like what Trump always, uh, you know, thinks, you know, he's not a racist, but he only hates non-whites, liberals, gays, immigrants, foreigners, mentally challenged, and Muslims. Now, if you don't have a sense of what privilege is, I suggest you to go home and to announce to everybody that you know, such as your, your roommate, your family, um, people who you work with, that you are queer or you are gay, and try being queer for a week and see how you're treated. And then you will understand the privilege of being a heterosexual. Let me move on to religion very quickly. Now, I'm a Christian. Christianity has been a central, has been central in the whole conquest in colonialism. And this is a history that we have to unpack and we have to recognize that, that Christendom involves in conquering, involves in crusade, converting, colonizing, and civilizing. Archbishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa once said, when Western missionaries came to South Africa, they had their Bible, we had our land, they converted us and asked us to close our eyes to pray. When we opened our eyes, we had their Bible and they had our land. And that's what colonialism is about. And we see in today's in today's climate, just look at our northern neighbor in Indonesia. There's so much exclusivism when we talk about religion. All these religious privileges as being a majority, oppression of minorities and so on, that we see in our everyday life in, in, in different countries. In the US, it would be a different thing, um, but similar kind of principles. So dialogue is important. The greatest antidote, according to Jonathan Sachs, the greatest antidote to violence is conversation. Speaking of fears, listening to the fears of others, and in that sharing of vulnerabilities, discovering a genesis of hope, which is really what we're doing here. I've got two more slides and, and I'll end. Inclusivity, social inclusivity especially, how far can you go? According to Desmond Tutu again, in this book that, that he wrote, he's a, he's a Christian bishop, right? And he wrote this book called God is Not a Christian. Very interesting book. And I quote, The Jesus I worship is not likely to collaborate with those who vilify and persecute an already oppressed minority. I myself cannot have oppressed the injustice of penalizing people for something about which they could do nothing. Their race. And then have kept quiet as women were penalized for something they could do nothing about their gender. Hence my support for the ordination of women to the priesthood and the episcopate. Uh, he's he's uh, cut his teeth on, uh, on, 
uh, the apartheid in, in South Africa. Now equally, I cannot keep quiet when, while people are being penalized for something about which they can do nothing, their sexuality, to discriminate against our sisters and brothers who are lesbian and gay on grounds of their sexual orientation, for me is as totally unacceptable and unjust as apartheid ever was. So to be inclusive means that you are fighting not just on one cause, but then fighting against one discrimination would necessarily mean that you have to fight against all kinds of uh, discrimination. Okay, a final story as I end. I remember when I was doing my PhD at the University of Western Australia, I was nominated by the Vice Chancellor to attend a National Student Leadership Forum in Canberra, where we spent about a week with national leaders in Australia uh, to learn about leadership. And most of the participants who are nominated to this very privileged forum came from Sydney, as you can imagine. Right? They're Sydney siders, very privileged. They're leaders of soccer, uh, football, footy clubs, and uh, rowing clubs, and so on. Their uncles might be MPs, you know, and they come from grammar schools and other private schools. Very, very few Asians, very few Aboriginals, very few Muslims. Um, so this, this handful of others tend to click together, and, and I belong to one of those, those groups. And so I remember in the forum, we divided into different groups, different circles, and then we will have one facilitator in each circle. The facilitator for my circle is Andrew. Now Andrew is a Sydney cider, a middle-aged male, lawyer, heterosexual, um, lives in a comfortable suburb in Sydney, and probably has a dog uh, as well. So he is the epitome of a middle-class, comfortable, white, privileged Australian. In one of those speeches, uh, where a Lebanese woman was speaking right after the Cronulla riots, talking about how she as a Muslim look at her identity as an Australian. She gave an hour-long speech which is very affectionate about her own identity as a Muslim female Australian. Andrew was closing his eyes throughout. And then after the speech, some of us rose to give her a standing ovation and Andrew was still closing his eyes. And I asked him, I said, Andrew, are you very tired? And he said, no. And I said, I noticed that for the past hour you've been closing your eyes. He said, I just can't, I just can't allow myself looking at this violence. And I said, what violence? A violence of a woman trapped beneath a veil. And I said, Andrew, did you ask her why she chose to wear the veil? He said, no. She's oppressed. She has no choice. I said, Andrew, what if the person who was speaking is a transgender woman? A man trapped in a woman's body. Are you going to close your eyes? Or are you going to ask her her story? Now, a lot of time, the easier way for us to deal with difference is to close our eyes. That we pretend that we understand their story, that we know everything about them, and we don't want to ask them we don't want to talk to them. We don't want to listen to their stories. And that is the easier way out. Are we going to open our eyes or are we going to close it? I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hun, for a very interesting presentation. Special thanks for sharing your personal experience as a teaching teacher in academia and, and also as a uh, former PhD student. Uh, can we uh, express our thanks to, to both speakers so far? Thank you. And uh, within the conference, there's also a new aspect of innovation. The, I'm not allowed to take any question from the floor. Uh, and as the master of ceremony explained, uh, we send questions in the writing. And so far, I've got two questions. The first one, what is your view on the trickle-down effect? 
and I'm not sure who would like to start first. What is your view on the trickle-down effect? And perhaps the author of the question can explain very briefly. Um, okay, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about the sort of trickle-down economics thing um, that uh, um, uh, was a, a very sort of popular, uh, I guess, economic theory, uh, you know, during the, 19, during the 1980s was certainly part of Reagan and Thatcher's um, uh, approach to public policy. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that what, it, what, what some of the graphic shows, or some of what the information shows, is that, in fact, uh, wealth doesn't actually trickle down, it, it, it stays concentrated. And uh, some may, but it happens disproportionately. And you know, the, the, the issue that I think that the, the graphics seem to be indicating was simply that um, the, the trend is, is that we're getting farther away from a state of, of, uh, of at least financial, and I would say social inequality. Um, uh, than, getting, than getting closer. I think that the policies, I think the Reagan-Thatcher policies have been, uh, have proven to be uh, uh, fallacious and, and flawed. Uh, I don't think that there's any, I don't think there's much evidence to suggest otherwise. And, and if that's the, what the question is about, that's, that's how I, uh, I, I view it. Um, the connection really, and one of the connections that we, we see here, oh, I don't have to get up and give this back, um, is simply that the, um, uh, that we do see connections, social connections, and, and wealth. So um, our society is probably even is probably divided uh, along uh, religious, racial, gender, so on and so forth lines in the same way that we see the accumulation of wealth. Um, and that's some of the connection. Thank you. And the second question is also to Professor Judas. The, and the question is, what is progressive taxation, and how does it work? Ah, well, um, uh, well, we experience it here uh, to a certain extent. Um, people who are, have, uh, whose earnings uh, are, are um, people's earnings are, are taxed in proportion with their size. So, uh, you know, if you, are, if, you have very, if you have low earnings, your taxation's very low, and as you earn more, you're, you're, you're taxed at a higher level. Um, in, and I, I, I have to say that in Australia, I was on a sort of, I, I fell on that spectrum. I really didn't do anything other than work here. So I, I, it was very simple. The government took money and they took, my, they, took, they took the money for taxation and used it in ways that they use it. Um, in the United States, what you have is a situation where you have a fundamental notion about uh, progressive taxation, yet you find that the, that the uh, elite wealth wealthy pay proportionally much lower taxes than those who are at lower incomes, middle income uh, earners. So you do have people who quite legitimately, uh, I mean, I, I don't doubt that when Donald Trump says, I don't pay taxes, that he's speaking the truth, that, that he doesn't pay taxes. And he may have done some of it illegally, but he doesn't. So, and so a, 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 a well-enforced progressive taxation system will uh, certainly mediate that. I think the late Terry Packer had something to say about taxes too, to a, to a Senate committee, and everyone got shocked at what he said, that's for sure. Would you please thank our speakers and our chair. One of the issues of, of these sorts of uh, panel discussions is we often have more questions than we have time. So other questions did come in, but unfortunately we just didn't have time to, uh, to process them all and, and, uh, and answer them. But I'm sure Maylene can give the questions to some of the, our speakers and they can perhaps pri provide an answer as, as needed. That would be very good. But thank you all for your efforts this afternoon or this morning. We're going to now have a group photo, and I'm not sure who's coordinating that, but I dare say we have to gather at the front and we perhaps um, position ourselves on the, on the platforms in front of us and, um, and certainly um, take a group photo. And then once the photo's done, uh, it'll be time for lunch. So please come forward and we position ourselves. And the photographers and others can help us get in position. Thank you. <laughs>